So our scripture reading this morning is going to be found in James chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. You can follow along on the screen or in your Bibles if you prefer. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man has great power at, as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Good morning. Buenos dias y bienvenidos a Iglesia de Cristo de Web Chapel. We're so thankful that you're here today. It is good to be here and to not be sweating in this room. Uh, I want to say a big thank you to Steve Mankin and to uh, Grant Yoakum and to Victor Moorhead. Uh, they worked diligently this week to get some air back in the rest of the building. The office still doesn't have air yet, but uh, I think they're going to get it for us because they want to keep the work to keep going here at Web Chapel, and we're not going to work without air. So uh, we're, we're glad uh, that they were able to do that, to work so diligently to get that back for us. Uh, because of the lack of air conditioning in the facility on Thursday, we were not able to have summer learning camp, but it's coming back on Tuesday, and we're excited about that. Uh, every, every week during the summer, I try to get up and tell you a little bit about what's going on with summer learning camp and tell you if you want to be involved to speak with Carol. Well, Carol sent me a text yesterday and said, here's how people can be involved. On July 14th, there will be a dinner celebrating summer learning camp. The families of the children that we are working with will be invited to come and be a part of that evening. We would like for our family here at Webb Chapel to come and interact with those families. There's a sign-up sheet on the welcome desk. We need a good, solid count by July 7th, so please uh, sign up for that. On July 10th, we're going to be putting together, together some pencil boxes for the summer learning camp participants and if you want to help put those boxes together to pray over those, to write notes in those, no RSVP needed, just on July 10th, uh, come and work with that. There's something for everybody to do as part of summer learning camp, and we're excited about that here at Web Chapel. I want to tell you about something that happened this week that was absolutely amazing, and I don't use those words lightly. I, I, I shared with you last week that we were leaving uh, yesterday, or last Sunday afternoon to go down to Palestine, Texas to spend some time with my mom and dad, specifically my dad for Father's Day. And we got down there and I was able to lead worship for the great people at the Crockett Road Church of Christ. My parents wanted me to send a message to all of you. Uh, as most of you know, my mother had a, a concussion a few weeks ago. She was not able to attend worship up until last Sunday night she was able to come. But, and I didn't realize this, but when you have a concussion as severe as mom's was, you don't handle sensory input real well. You don't do lights real well. You don't do loud noises real well. She couldn't watch TV, uh, specifically her news programs that she likes to watch. She couldn't, she couldn't do all of that. And so really, she spent a lot of the last month sitting on her back porch just being still. But the one thing that she said that was really an encouragement to her was that every day dad would haul up from the mailbox a stack of cards from the Webb Chapel Church of Christ. And she wanted me to tell you thank you this morning. That, that was great. Let me get to the amazing part. We got up Monday morning. We drove down to Pearland, Texas, where I used to be the youth minister. And our plan was 
to drive, our, drive down to Wharton, Texas, where I was going to <clears throat> lead worship for a youth event at a congregation where a preacher friend of mine is now ministering. And so as we were getting ready to go, our best friend uh, in Pearland texted us, and she said, could you come to the building at 445? My husband wants to be baptized today. We've known this family for 15 years. These are our best friends in the world. The husband in this family is a man that I hold in the highest of regard. When I found out that I was ha we were having a little girl, I, I sought this fella out because he has two of the sweetest daughters you've ever met in your life. And I look to him as a role model. I look to him as someone that I respect. And now I call him brother. I was able to baptize him into Christ on Monday. And it was an awesome day. It was an amazing day. And it was a day that I believe happened because of prayer. There's been a lot of people praying for this fellow for a lot of years. I've known him for 15 years, but there was 15 years before that when the marriage started between this couple, and he wasn't a Christian. And his wife's family began praying for him. And I can't say that I prayed every day for my friend, but I can say I prayed for him a great deal. And I never doubted that he would come to faith. I had days where I, I was curious if it was going to happen that day or not, but I, I believed he was going to come and obey the gospel and God taught me a great lesson this last week that his timing is so perfect. And his timing is so, is so much different than our timing. He taught me a great lesson that we are blessed to be able to pray over those who are lost. We are best, blessed to be able to pray over those that we consider to be friends and role models. And God puts people in their lives to work on them. And then with the right time, they come to Christ. And today, as we continue our study of 1 Timothy, we're going to see that, that Paul wanted to instill into the young minister Timothy the idea of constant prayer, the idea of a fervent prayer life, the idea that as a minister that prayer would be essential for him to be able to do what he needed to do. I'd ask that you join me this morning in 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 1. If you have a, a Bible, you can follow along that way or you can follow along on our screens. But 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, says this. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that they may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Our goal today is to see that we need to be in prayer on behalf of others, that we need to commit to having that kind of a prayer life, that we need to lift up the lost, that we need to lift up our leaders, that we need to lift up one another, that we need to pray for all people, even the people that we don't like or that we don't get along with, we need to pray for them. And it's not that God doesn't know those needs. It's not that God doesn't understand the hearts of men. It is that we get to partner with God and we get to pray to God through Jesus Christ on behalf of those whom we care about, on behalf of those that aren't our best friends, on behalf of those who need those prayers. One more thing. You might remember a few weeks ago, I was talking about prayer and I passed out some cards and on those cards, I said, write down three names of three people that you would like to share the gospel with. Three people that you will begin praying for today. My friend I baptized on Monday was number one on my list. Pretty amazing to see what God can do. I hope you're still praying for those. I've got to put someone else on my list now. I hope that you do as well. 
as we begin this morning, I want us to understand that, that Paul was urging Timothy to pray. It wasn't that he was telling Timothy this was a good idea. He wasn't saying you might want to do this if you get around to it or if you have time. He was telling him to, that prayer would be a vital part of his ministry. That prayer was necessary in order for him to be an effective minister, for him to be an effective Christian. And as we stated early on in the study, this is a personal letter, but it's not a private letter. Meaning that there are things that Paul wrote to Timothy that he wanted Timothy to share with the rest of the church. And I believe that Paul wants us to have the kind of prayer life that he's telling Timothy to have. And though all of us are not professional ministers, all of us who have been added to the church, all of us who have been baptized for the remission of our sins are ministers of the new covenant. We need to be in prayer. We need to commit to being in prayer on behalf of others and to see what God will do when we pray to him. Now you might read this and think Paul is just using four different words, all meaning prayer, and to an extent you would be right. But each one of these words carries with it a little different aspect of prayer. You see, Paul did not want Timothy to just pray the same old rope prayers over and over and over again. He wanted him to have an active prayer life. He wanted him to have an engaging prayer life. And so, in order to do that, he talks about different kinds of prayers that we can pray. He begins by talking about supplications. And supplication is not a word that we use very often in our society today. But think of supplication as being the things that are most important on your heart at that moment. <clears throat> think about the young minister Timothy as he's being sent to do the job of someone that he respects very much. He's had the Apostle Paul as his teacher and as, and as his example. There would have been some things on Timothy's heart like anxiety. He might have had some anxiety going and teaching about elders and deacons and things of that nature. He might have had some anxiety on his heart being a young minister. And he's asking uh, Timothy, he's telling Timothy to bring these supplications, these things that were most important on his heart, before God. And we too need to do the same thing. We have anxieties. We have life issues. We have things that happen. We need to bring those things to God. The Greek word for prayers used here begins with the prefix pros. Pros means to come towards or to come near. And I believe we all understand that when we are praying to God that we come near God. Sometimes we say we come before the throne of grace. We are approaching God. We are drawing near to God. When we pray, we need to draw near to God. When we pray, we need to approach God. When we pray, we need to come towards God. And I know you may be thinking, well, of course we do, and don't we do that anyway? Not necessarily. If we're not intentional about coming before God, if we're not intentional about approaching God, then it's just words. It's just words that we're speaking. We need to be intentional about approaching and coming towards God. The next kind of prayer he talks about is an intercessory prayer. When we pray for somebody else, when we pray for God to intervene in a situation, that is intercessory prayer. Our scripture reading today from the book of James dealt with intercessory prayer. If you are sick, call the elders of the congregation to come pray over you and anoint your head with oil. They are praying on behalf of someone who is sick. Confess your sins one to another. That is intercessory prayer. We're praying that the sin be taken out of someone else's life. As a minister, this is a prayer that, Paul, that Timothy would pray very often. He would pray on behalf of those who were sick. He would pray on behalf of those who were struggling with sin. He would pray on behalf of those who had yet, not yet come to know Jesus Christ. The last kind of prayer that Paul encourages Timothy to pray are prayers of thanksgiving. And prayers of thanksgiving are exactly what they sound like. Giving thanks to God for what he has done in our lives. 
You know, it's really easy for us to come to God and to pray to Him. It's really easy for us when things are terrible in our life to come to God and to ask Him to make those things better. It's easy for us to come before God in an intercessory prayer and pray for someone else who is sick or hurting. But how often do we take time just to pray to thank God for answering those prayers? And don't don't be fooled, God always answers our prayers. My friend that I baptized on Monday, someone's been praying for him for the last 30 years. And it would be easy for people that were praying for him to think, well, God just doesn't answer my prayer because he hasn't become a Christian yet. When in reality, God was answering that prayer. God was answering that prayer by bringing the right people into his life. He was answering that prayer by using his own children to break the bread of life to him. And those of you that are parents in the room, those of you that have children, don't think that your children can't share the gospel with somebody. Because I saw it happen in this last week. I saw this man's daughter love her daddy so much that she started having conversations with him about what it meant to be a Christian. And we give thanks for that today. We don't give enough thanks when we pray. It is perfectly acceptable to have a prayer where you ask for absolutely nothing and you just spend your time thanking God for all that he has done. We sing that song, Count Your Blessings, name them one by one. Have you ever actually done that? Have you ever actually stopped to name your blessings one by one? There's not enough hours in the day to to name all of our blessings one by one. And it's perfectly all right to, to give thanks to God. I want us to commit to praying for others. I want us to commit to praying on behalf of others. For those things that are on our hearts and are vital to us. For those prayers to bring us close to God as we pray to Him. To intercede on behalf of those who are lost or who are sick or who are hurting. And to give thanksgiving to God for hearing our prayers and answering our prayers even when He answers them in ways that we don't necessarily like or on a timetable that we don't necessarily like. We must commit to praying on behalf of others. And we must commit to praying on behalf of all people. Paul knew that Timothy, in a local ministry situation, was going to run into people who were in opposition to what he was doing. Being a Christian in the first century was exciting, but it was also extremely dangerous. We know that Paul had a former life as a Pharisee where he went and he hunted down Christians, that he held the coats of those who would stone people like Stephen. And so this is the time that they're living in. It would have been difficult, at least for me as a minister, to pray for those who were holding the coats of those who were stoning my brothers and sisters in Christ. It would have been difficult for me to pray for the leaders who were dipping Christians in tar and lighting them on fire to light their gardens at night. And yet, according to this, I have to pray for them. I have to pray for all those people. You know, we live in a country where we are blessed to be able to freely worship like this. But don't be fooled. Our way of life is under attack. There are people who would like to see this place shut down. There are people who would like to see us not gather together on Sunday mornings. There are people that absolutely hate us because we believe in God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And guess what? you got to pray for them too. Jesus said to pray for your enemies. He said to pray for those who persecute you. The Apostle Paul is basically restating that by saying pray for all people. And so we pray for those that we love. We pray for our friends that haven't come to Christ yet. But we also pray for those who cut us off in traffic. We pray for those who have bad neighbors that don't cut their grass. We pray for those that are hateful to us. We pray for those that don't vote like we do on election day. We pray for those people. We do that on their behalf. We commit to it because this is pleasing to God. And while we are talking about praying for all people, it's not just praying for the people that don't vote like you do on election day. It's praying for the people you didn't vote for on election day too. It's praying for those in positions of authority. It's praying 
for the principals and the teachers and the other administrators at your children's schools. It's praying for our shepherds here at the Webb Chapel Church of Christ. It's praying for leadership of the church the world over because they have such a heavy task on their shoulders. It is praying that we would live a peaceful and quiet life. And this one's very difficult for us because it seems more and more the people that are in power in worldly positions are more and more corrupt all the time. And we look at them and we see their corrupt nature and we see the things we disagree with. And Paul says, you got to pray for those people. Jesus says, you got to pray for your enemies. And we say, you didn't mean them though, right? Because they're, they're bad people. No, you got to pray for the bad people too. And that's so hard for us. But remember that we were all bad people at one point. That outside of Christ, we were all bad sinners that outside of christ we had no hope of heaven we were all bad people at one point and somebody probably prayed for you i think about my friend that i baptized on monday and i wonder what if everyone had just stopped praying for him what if everyone just said you know what he is stubborn he is never going to come to christ i have other people that i can pray about i really wonder what would have happened and i'm glad i didn't have to find out we need to pray for everyone, especially those in authority. We need to commit to praying on their behalfs daily. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. That's what Jesus said. Paul knew the truth. He came to the truth a little differently than everyone else that I know of came to the truth. I don't know anybody else who was walking down the road, who was blinded, who was ministered to by Ananias. I don't know anyone else that, that came to Christ that way. Timothy was a nice young man. He was someone who had had faith demonstrated for him by his grandmother and his mother. He was somebody that Paul had mentored. And he had come to this knowledge of the truth. He came to it differently than Paul did. But he came to this knowledge of the truth. And, and Paul wanted Timothy to share this truth that he knew with everyone that he met with Jews, with Gentiles, with those practicing pagan religions, the nuns and the duns. He wanted him to share the truth with everyone he met. And guess what? We got to do the same thing. We need to share our knowledge of the truth. And one way that we can do that is through prayer. We can pray for God to put people in our lives to share the truth with. We can pray that we would be bold enough to share the truth Whenever someone asks us about the truth, and God will provide, we need to commit to that kind of prayer. I love this passage of Scripture right here. I want to share, you, share with you why. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, listen to this, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. I love that passage because it means that there's nobody that God doesn't want to see to be saved. The vilest of offender, the worst sinner out there, God wants them to be saved. There is nobody out there that has sinned so much that God is not bigger than their sin. That gives me hope. And who are we to say they don't deserve the gospel? Who are we to say they are beyond salvation? God doesn't want anyone to sin. God created this, this world. He created humanity in his image and his likeness, and he wants his children to come home. And if we will commit to praying on behalf of others, we will see that there is nobody that is too far from God. We will see that there is nobody that God can't save. And more than that, there's nobody that God doesn't want to save. He wants everyone to come to a knowledge of truth. And we get to be part of that. We get to be part of that. We get to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And sometimes we just say, I've got better things to do. I'm too busy to pray. I'm too busy to go and share my faith. I'm too busy to lift somebody up. I'm glad that somebody wasn't too busy to share their faith with my parents and my grandparents and me. 
And I'm glad that somebody wasn't too busy to share their faith with all of you here today. I'm glad that somebody wasn't too busy to share their faith with my friend I baptized this week. And I pray that none of us are too busy. Because if God's not too busy, then none of us have an excuse. <clears throat> Paul goes on to, to say that there is one God and there is one mediator. The, the purpose behind saying one God was really twofold. The first part is that this was a link between uh, Judaism and Christianity. There was a lot of, there's a lot of differences between Judaism and Christianity, but one thing we can agree on is that there is one God, that there is one true God, the Father. And so for many Jews, becoming a Christian was actually an easy transition. They saw that Jesus was the fulfillment of prophecy and that he was the Messiah, and so they came to Christianity. For some Jews, they didn't believe it. There are still Jews today who don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. That's why we still have synagogues, and that's why we still have people that are uh, in the Jewish faith. But Paul wanted Timothy to be able to, to find, build a bridge between Jews and Christians. And so we believe that there is one God. That's common ground. That's something we can stand on. That's something we can build a relationship on. The other part of this, saying that there was one God, was not everyone during the first century were Jews. There were people outside of the Jewish faith. There were people practicing pagan religions that prayed to many different gods. In fact, in Acts 17, when Paul goes to Mars Hill, he says, I see that you are very religious. And he talks about the different gods that they worship. He says, you even have a plaque to the unknown God. He says, what you worship as unknown, I worship as known. There is one God. And while that may seem like a moot point in this gathering, I think it's very important for us to understand that there is only one true living God. The people that you meet, the people that you're praying for or should be committed to praying for may have other gods in their lives. And, and, and we can get very specific here. There are some that believe in Muhammad. There are some that believe in Buddha. There are some that believe in other pagan gods. And those are the people that God wants to see come to him and we're his hands and feet. So you're going to meet people that literally believe in another God. But you're going to meet other people that have other gods in their lives as well. Money, career, sports, family. For some, even religion is a God that they worship. And we need to proclaim that there is one God. We need to proclaim that there is one mediator. In our study of Hebrews, we talked about this extensively, about how when Jesus went to the cross of Calvary, when he poured out his blood on that cross, that he established a new covenant, that he became the mediator of that new covenant, that he now sits at the right hand of God at the throne of grace and intercedes on our behalf. Something that amazes me about prayer is this. When was the last time you tried to get an audience with somebody who was in charge of anything? When was the last time you were in a place and you said, I'd like to speak with your boss or I'd like to speak with your manager? Do you get to see that person right away most of the time? No. Do you have a limited amount of time that you do get to see that person if you do? Yes. Here's the great thing about being a child of God. God who is in charge of everything, God who is in control of everything, wants a relationship with you, and there's no limit on the time you can spend speaking to God. You have an audience with God anytime you want it. You can speak to God as long as you want to, and it's not that he's doing it out of some sense of obligation. He wants to hear from his children. He needs to hear from his children. And we are blessed to be able to pray to God, the one God and the one mediator, Jesus Christ. We must commit to praying on behalf of others. We must take advantage of that relationship and never take it for granted. When we think of the word ransom, we think of someone who has been kidnapped. We think of a large sum of money being withdrawn from the bank, maybe put in a briefcase and exchanged for that person to come back to their family. And that's a, that in our 21st century mindset, that's exactly what a ransom is. I want you to think for a moment, though, that this is being written in a time 
when slavery is commonplace. And the word used for ransom, the Greek word used for ransom here in our English Bibles, literally means to redeem a slave. It literally means that somebody would take the place of a slave, either through giving money or taking the place of the slave on their own. In a very real way, the ransom that Jesus paid was the redeeming of many slaves. Because you see, outside of Christ, we are enslaved to sin. Outside of Christ, we have no hope of redemption. And Jesus said, I'm the ransom. I'll take your place. I will redeem you. That's what Jesus did on the cross for our sins. If you had a friend who was in the bondage of slavery, wouldn't you do everything you could to get your friend out of that bondage of slavery? Wouldn't you pay any amount of money that you could? Wouldn't you maybe even give your own life to get that person out of that slavery? I'm here to tell you this morning the ransom was paid on the cross of Calvary. And you don't have to really do anything. You couldn't do anything. You couldn't pay that ransom because you have sin in your life. It was taken away by that ransom. We need to commit to praying for those who are slaves to sin. We need to commit to praying that they will take advantage of the ransom that was paid on the cross of Calvary. And we need to thank God that we get to be a part of his story. Last week we talked about purpose a great deal. We established that God will provide purpose to anyone that wants purpose. And this week we get a little glimpse into the purpose of the Apostle Paul. As I mentioned last week, Paul was a very uh, purpose-oriented person. and He had on his mind what he needed to do and he accomplished his goals. He wanted that for Timothy. He wanted Timothy to also have purpose. He instilled in Timothy purpose. That's a big part of this private letter, or this personal letter, was to instill that purpose into Timothy. One of the purposes he wanted to instill into Timothy was that Timothy would be a prayerful Christian and minister in that order. That he would first be a follower of Christ, second be a minister of the gospel. The idea of being appointed is setting something in place, setting someone in place, establishing someone or something. The apostle Paul was an apostle and a preacher because he was appointed by God to that position. God saw the good in the Pharisee Saul. He saw how zealous he was. He saw how committed he was to the word, even though he was misguided in his commitment to the word. And he saw something and someone he could use. And so he appointed him to be a preacher and an apostle. Again, we're not all professional ministers here, but I will say to you that each and every one of us has something in us that God can use to reach the lost. And it may be the thing that you have is your ability to pray for those who are outside of Christ. That may be the only thing that you can do. And I say to you, if that's the only thing you can do, get to work. Because God expects us to do that. We weren't appointed like Paul was appointed. But when we put on Christ in baptism, we assumed certain responsibilities. And part of that responsibility was reaching and saving the lost for Jesus Christ. When we think of a preacher, you think of someone like me. You think of someone who stands up in front of a congregation, who brings messages from God's Word, and that's an apt description of a preacher. But the word preacher here actually is more akin to the term herald, someone that would proclaim something. In fact, it can even be used to describe a town crier. We don't have town criers anymore because we have the Internet But used to, we had town criers, we had people that would go around and tell important news in town. One of my favorite movies to watch, especially this time of year, is the movie The Patriot with Mel Gibson. And in that movie, they ratify to raise up an army that eventually becomes the army that defeats uh, Great Britain in the Revolutionary War. As that decision is made, a young man comes out out of the meeting hall and he says, The levy passed! The levy passed! That was the kind of thing a town crier did. As a preacher, 
As someone who proclaims the gospel, we need to share the good news just like a town crier. We need to share that with the people and the communities that we love and we care about. The town crier's position was extremely important because they shared good news. Well, we need to share good news as well. One way we can do that is through prayer. Letting those people who are lost know, you know what, I'm praying about you. You know what, I, I pray that, that God is going to work on your heart. You know what, I'm praying that God puts the right people in your life. You have no idea what that does for people. You have no idea how those words can help people. Paul was appointed. He was appointed differently than any other preacher or apostle. But he wanted to instill in young Timothy what he needed to be a great minister. And I hope that we see in this letter that we need to adopt some of these things in our lives as well. And our commitment must be to faith and truth. Because one is impossible without the other. You can put faith in something that's not truthful. It's not going to last. But if you put your faith in truth, and we know that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If we put our faith in the truth, and we put our faith in Jesus Christ, then we know that what we put our faith in is truthful, and that it will never go away. And one way that we can do that is to pray. One way that we can show that faith and our, our belief in the truth of Jesus Christ is to pray, and to pray through Jesus to God on behalf of others that so desperately need it. I'm really glad that I never gave up on my friend. And I'm really glad that a lot of other people never gave up on him. And I'm really glad that today he took communion for the first time, and it meant something. I'm glad that I get to call him brother. But for every one friend like that, how many friends do we have that we haven't shared the gospel with? How many friends do we have that we haven't helped come to Christ? Can we get over our own pride and our own ego and understand that maybe someone else is going to be the one that ultimately brings them to Christ and see that we're just a little part of the story? I, I hope so. We're going to talk some more about prayer next week but for this week i'd like to encourage you to begin if you haven't already to be committed to praying for people on their behalfs on the on the front of the bulletin this week in my article I've, I've given you some people that you can pray about some some institutions that we need to be praying about in our small group this week i hope if you're participating in a small group that you'll do a time of directed prayer i've given some some guide for that this week before we end today, there, there is one prayer request on, in my article that I really want everyone to commit to, and that is for our youth minister search. We have a young man named Harmon and his wife Charisma who have agreed to come and be with us on July 10th. He's going to teach class. There's going to be a potluck meal following. I would ask that you commit to pray for Harmon and Charisma today. This is a young couple who will be their first time in ministry. And we may get to be the people that make or break their career in ministry. I ask that you would pray for them. Today I know that there are those who don't know Jesus. You're like my friend. You're good people. You're good parents. You're in the workforce. You're respected in your particular uh, field. But you don't know Jesus. You haven't put on Christ in baptism. You haven't expressed your love for Christ and expressed the need for your forgiveness for your sins in baptism. If, if that's the case today, don't wait any longer. But if you're like my friend and you need a little bit more time, know that we're praying for you. Today, if you are in need of prayer, we want to commit to praying on your behalf. We see it as an honor and a privilege. And we would ask that if you need prayers today, that you would not leave this place without asking for them. If you're joining us through our live stream, thank you for your presence today. Please use one of the points of contact on your screen. We'll be happy to, to get back with you. If you're here today and you need to respond to the Lord's invitation anyway, please do so as we stand and as we sing.